I've been doing a lot of consulting in my life. This means essentially going to companies and seeing a lot of different companies. So you could challenge whether or not I have a deep knowledge, but I do have a broad knowledge, meaning that I've seen a lot of different situations. And one thing I see in companies, when I go there, is that especially in large companies, there are people whose job is to, quote, define the process. That's what they do, okay? Especially in large, traditional company. What do you do for a living? I'm defining the processes. Um, sometimes it's their big job. Sometimes uh, it's something they do for a few months. And uh, this presentation comes out of the fact that I'm, I'm sorry for these people. Uh, because uh, nobody loves them first. Okay? So after a few months defining the process, they come up with a beautiful document. Uh, they go to people and say, here is how you should work. And the reactions range, well, uh, usually across the passive-aggressive spectrum, ranging from ignoring them to uh, feigning death. And uh, uh, in general, I believe that what they do is not even possible. I don't think you can define the processes. To explain this, uh, I googled for defined process. This is what I found. Uh, this is what a defined process looks like, right? Small boxes, sorry, small boxes and arrows. It's a flowchart with people. It defines uh, who's supposed to do what, when, under which circumstances. So it's this idea that you can look at the system. We're a company. I look at you. I look at the way you work. And I say, this is not optimal. Now let me find a better way. And then I design a better way. And then I show it to you. This is an old idea. It comes with a lot of, it's part of a philosophy of management. What do I do? And this idea actually goes back like 100 years. So this is the first part of my talk. This idea is called the scientific management. We just call it management these days. Do you know who this guy is? Frederick Taylor. Yeah. Uh, he's not as instantly recognizable as, uh, say, Gandhi or Einstein, but you could argue that he had just as much of an effect, as much of an impact on the 20th century. Uh, he's also one of the most incredibly controversial figures of the 20th century. If you go online, you will find, for example, I found a documentary while preparing this speech, uh, that was called Taylor, the biggest bastard ever. <laughs> and on the other end, I found papers where he was described as kind of a saint. Okay? But whatever you think of Taylor, you got to grant it to the man, he was a genius. And his basic idea was the following, what he called the scientific management. Uh, I will give you Taylor's own favorite example. He looked at people uh, loading what, what is called pig iron. Pig iron is an, in an intermediate product of iron working. And he said, the average worker can load 12 tons of pig iron per day, 12 tons and a half. And he will earn $1.15. We're talking the first uh, 10 years of the 20th century here. But if you do it right, if you analyze the way this person is working, then a single person can load up to 54 tons per day. And if you pay this person by the amount of pig iron he loads, he will be able to earn much more. So it's in their own best interest, okay? How do they do that? Well, these guys are working, okay? And there is this dude here with a clock measuring them. 
Now this is the clock here. So he's measuring them all day. And then he's saying, hey, this is a waste of movement. Now you do this instead. And they execute. I have a note somewhere. Here. From Taylor. If you are a high-priced man, you will do exactly as this man tells you tomorrow. This is Taylor talking to this guy, okay? From morning till night. When he tells you to pick up a pig and walk, you pick it up and you walk. When he tells you to rest, you sit down and rest. You do that right straight through the day. And what's more, no back talk. Now, a high-priced man does just what he's told to do. No back talk. Do you understand that? When this man tells you to walk, you walk. He tells you to sit down, you sit down. You don't talk back at him. Now, of course, this is... Uh, today, for our modern sensitivity, this looks really inhuman. But back then, it was more commonly accepted. A few people did complain. Hmm? Unions, artists. But ultimately, whether you like it or not, Scientific management, this idea, it made the century. It changed society forever. I mean, assembly lines. People building cars and earning more money so that the people who were building the cars could afford to buy the cars and become consumers. That's where we all come from. It worked. It worked for like 100 years. So now we come up, the agile people, and we say, okay, today what we are doing, this is from Wikipedia, today what we are doing is scientific management. Yeah, it comes under different labels. You can call it slightly differently. It doesn't really look exactly the same, but the principles are the same. And we say it doesn't work. It doesn't work for software, for example. I do software, that's what I do. And there is a struggle there. The thing is, if it doesn't work, how come it worked for one century? I, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, okay? We are at an agile conference, and so you can tell me, hey, dude, uh, you don't need to convince us. We know it doesn't work. But this is not enough. We got to explain why it doesn't work. And it worked for one century. Something is amiss, right? So let's see. Where can we turn to decide why this thing doesn't work? There is a thing called complexity theory. Bear with me. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Imagine this. Uh, you're driving home, okay? And you see, you're almost home after work. You see your reserve light blinking. You're almost out of fuel. What do you do? Find the next gas station. Find the next gas station, maybe. Maybe I can say, hey, I have enough fuel to get home and I can't be bothered because I'm lazy, okay? I will do that tomorrow. Huh? <laughs> or I can say, hey, tomorrow uh, there is a strike, so I won't be able to refill my tank. Let's do that now. Whatever you do, the point is you know exactly what's going to happen. It's not that hard. You look at the system, okay, it's obvious what's going to happen. You predict the future. This is quite a powerful idea, predicting the future. This is what, in the theory of complexity, is called a simple system. These are causes and these are effects. And in a simple system, the relationship between cause and effect is clear beforehand to everybody. You know what's going to happen. If you know what's going to happen, How do you behave? What's the ideal thing to do? Think about cases where you are working. You have a simple task, okay? Can you give me a few examples 
of a simple thing that you do in your work. in a physical sense. Yeah, it behaves pretty much the same every time. If you jump off the window, you know what's going to happen, indeed. <laughs> something, something that's work-related. Something that you did the last week that is simple. A stand-up. Stand uh, I'm not so sure, but for sure you know that at 9 o'clock you got to stand up in that corner and other people are going to join you, hopefully, yeah. Uh, I mean, going to a stand, maybe not uh, taking part in the stand-up, but going to the stand-up, yeah, simple rule, nine, each day, boring, yeah? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, in one particular model that I stole information from that is called the Canafin model, this state, simple, which is actually now they call it obvious, but it's the same thing, huh? uh, they have mnemonics, uh, small ideas that can remind you what simple means. For simple, they use a bicycle. Because you know a bicycle, you know what's going to happen on a bicycle. After the few, a few times falling, you learn it, and it behaves pretty much the same every time. You can wrap your head around it. This is a simple system. How do you solve a simple problem? You are given a simple problem, what do you do now? the same thing every day, right? You do the same thing every time. You can predict the future. Why the standard procedure? Why the standard procedure? It, follow the standard procedure. So, follow a procedure, come on. And it's very likely that there is the same procedure that works every time. So, you call that a best practice, and you do it every time. Best practices. If you go to a big company, they're obsessed by this stuff. Best practices. Now, second example. Forget about simple. Now you don't, you're not driving your car. Now you, you buy a car, but to spare some money, you buy all the pieces of the car in a big box, and you bring it home, and now you're left with a blueprint and all the pieces of your car laying on the floor there. Now, clearly this is not simple anymore. Well, okay, I need to think now, okay? But you can study the blueprint. I mean, you can still predict the future. It's only harder. You study and then you come to the conclusion, okay, I will put these pieces together and they will fit like that. This is what is called in Complexity theory, complicated. You still predict the future, but you need to look real hard. Wait, this is going, no. Okay, wait a minute, okay, now I can see that. What do you do in your job that is complicated? Design software. No, designing software, is an interesting answer, but I will get back to this later. Hiring people. Huh? Hiring people. Hiring people. Is it complicated? I mean, I don't think it's complicated. I think it's worse. Because if I want to hire you, I can look at you very hard for a while and maybe interview you, and then I hire you, and then I find out that you are actually a jerk, impossible to work with. So I cannot predict the future. No, no, I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm talking about me, of course. <laughs> so stuff where you can predict the future, I don't know, budgeting. You cannot predict the sales. Can, can, can from the client. 
one thing, uh, I'm a developer, one thing that I do that is complicated, for example, is, uh, okay, I have to upgrade software. Hmm? I have to upgrade the library. I mean, I know I'm gonna make it. But at every step, I'm like, oh damn, no. Okay, they deprecated this call. Okay, let me change this. I mean, I find out stuff as I go, but ultimately I'm gonna make it. Dealing with people is definitely, I'm sorry, not complicated because people are unpredictable. Take my word for it. Yeah. You can't analyze people. This is the realm of analysis, okay? This is the place where you, you look very hard at the lines and try to make sense of them. This is called analysis. Either that or you hire somebody who already knows the solution to your problem. You hire an expert. But I will come back to what you guys said about people uh, soon. For now, let me give you a mnemonic about complicated. A 747. This is complicated. I mean, I don't know why it flies, honest. But give me 10 years and enough books and I will find out. Okay? Either that or I can hire an engineer, a an aeronautic engineer, and ask her, look, wh why does it fly, this thing? And she can tell me. This is the realm of skills. This is how you solve complicated problems. Either you analyze, or you hire somebody who already knows the solution. You ask the expert. Now we're getting into the interesting part. Okay, now you're not driving a car. You are not assembling a car. Now you are designing a car. You said design a software. I want you to design a city car that takes over 4% of the European market within five years. And you sit down and you study. And you study your ass off. And at the end of it all, can you guarantee that you will get that market? You can't. No matter how hard you look at the lines, you don't know. You can't predict the future, no matter how hard you look at it. This is called the complex. There is a relationship between cause and effect, okay? Once you succeed or fail, you will look back and in retrospect, you will say, yeah, of course we didn't, we didn't get that market. The car was only available in pink. People don't like pink cars, for example. But you can only say that after the fact. You cannot predict the future. Hiring, dealing with people, design software, people in particular. People are the complex system. Complex, amongst other things, means that if you do exactly the same thing twice, you might get different results. People. So what do you do when you're dealing with a complex problem? First of all, let me give you once again a little mnemonic. Mnemonic for complex is a frog because it's a living system. It's more than the sum of its parts. You can take a frog apart, you can't put it back together. <laughs> try, no, don't try it. <laughs> okay. So what do you do when you're dealing with a frog? How do you solve a complex problem? First, how you don't solve a complex problem. You can't follow a procedure, I mean, definition of procedure. You can't predict the future, you don't know what's going to happen. Best practices do not exist. You do the same thing twice, you might get different results. Analyzing is pretty much useless. You can look very hard at this cloud, you can look at it and squint forever. No clue. Definition of complex. And 
you can't ask the experts. They know as much as you do. So the only way that we know how to deal with a complex problem is incrementally. That is, essentially, you touch here, ouch, and you see this happening, and then you go like, oh, okay, these are connected. So you take a small step, you see what happens, you learn, and then you repeat. This is what we call incrementing knowledge, right? Knowledge activities. So, to recap, we have simple, cause and effect are obvious to everybody. We have complicated, cause and effect are connected, but you need to analyze, to study, to see the connection, and complex. You cannot see the connection until after the fact. Let's put them in a line. Okay. Where is scientific management? When I tell you to walk, you walk. When I tell you to rest, you rest. Here, it's definitely square there. Two, I, I see you in particular are puzzled. <laughs> to to uh, dispel a possible misunderstanding. You might think, hey, wait a minute, I have to analyze a process, right? I have to look at the way these guys are working and come up with an optimized process. So this is complicated. And indeed, Taylor said, the science of handling pig iron is so great that the average worker who's handling pig iron would never understand it because he's too stupid. Taylor was like, like that. Only a gentleman like me can actually understand that. He split the world in two categories. People who decide what's the best thing to do, and people who do it. People who decide are indeed working in a complicated environment. You got to do the analysis. Then you pass it on to the stupid worker who's doing it. This worker is, by definition, doing simple things. Otherwise, you can't have a clock and a procedure. So now the question becomes, if scientific management is here, then where is software development? Is it simple, complicated, complex? OK, uh, no, nobody's going to hang and die with suspense to wait for the answer. We know it's not simple, but the fact that we know, again, I got to prove it somehow, right? So let's look at software development for a moment. To do this, let me go back to scientific management. There was this other guy who was uh, uh, the other popular scientific management guy at the time of Taylor. He was called Gilbreth. He, for example, he's the guy who invented the concept of best practices. He invented these. He invented the idea, for example, that in uh, a surgeon needed an assistant passing tools to the surgeon. He was into optimizing a lot. Also, he had 11 kids. And uh, in this video, you can see his wife. She's, she's laughing in the video, no doubt, because she's on the verge of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> and interestingly, most of the idea of Gilbreth actually came from his wife. She was the, the real genius in the family. And so, nature has justice. So on one side, it created males bigger so that we could take credit for uh, women's work. On the other side, we die earlier. So uh, Gilbert's wife uh, lived like 50 years longer than her husband, and she kept writing and writing and coming up with new ideas. The reason I'm telling you all this story, uh, I want to stress out that, to stress that these people were not academics, they were pop stars. 
the ideas of these people became so popular that we are still living off these ideas. His kids wrote this book, which became a bestseller. It inspired Hollywood movies. It was called like this, because this guy, uh, Gilbert, when a stranger asked, uh, how come you have so many kids? He pretended to think about it, and he said, oh, you know, they come cheaper by the Dalton. He was into economies of scale. The reason he became so popular was motion studies. What's motion study? The idea that uh, you can take the motions of a worker, the detailed motions, and break them down into a flow, a very detailed flow, and then optimize. He actually came up with this idea by, for example, look at this guy filing small pieces. You see, it's a repetitive work. Now he's waiting. This machine is going to finish its job soon. I watched this video hundreds of times. And now he's picking up the pieces and replacing them. Then, after optimizing, Gilbert could move the pieces a little, okay? To reduce the amount of physical movement. And now he's faster, yay. <laughs> to formalize this thing, he came up with this weird idea of a thing that he called Terblix. It's Gilbert uh, in reverse, uh, you know? Uh, silly marketing existed back then, just like now. And it's uh, small pieces of movement. Again, I have something here. Oh, this is nice because it's about, um, it's an example about shaving. So I actually put a razor here. I'm not going to shave. Here. This is a modern razor, but bear with me. So, suppose a man goes into a bathroom to shave. We'll assume his face is all lathered and he's ready to pick up his razor. He knows where the razor is, but first he must locate it with his eye. This is search. First terblik, okay? Um, then his eye finds the razor and comes to rest. That's find. Second term blink. Sir can select the process of sliding the razor prior to the fourth term blink, grasp. Fifth, transport loaded. Okay? And so on and so on. Oh, sixth is position. Sorry, it was two movement. Transport loaded, position. It's weird, eh? <laughs> it's probably not so weird to developers, however. This is an algorithm, eh? It's a program. This guy was ahead of his time. So was Taylor. They were programming machines. Only these machines happen to be people. Think about it when we call people resources because that's where the idea comes from. <clears throat> Interestingly, Gilbreth divided Terblix into effective and ineffective, what we now would call waste. Effective ones were stuff like grasp. Ineffective ones were stuff like search or plan, thinking what to do next. That's a waste of time. Could you build a machine that shaves you? I the shaving example, it comes from Gilbert. I, I, I understand that not everybody shaves, in particular uh, women and um, hipsters today. <laughs> but bear with me, okay? Could you build a machine that shaves you? Yeah. I suppose you could. I'm not really sure I would <laughs> get in, but yeah. But it's hard, right? It uh, looks a bit dangerous, and the reason why it's a bit dangerous is that shaving is about physical stuff. It's made of atoms, 
and atoms are hard to deal with. On the other hand, you can build a machine that moves iron. That's how we move iron today. What's special with software development? The special thing with software development is that we don't have the atoms. We have bits, and bits are lighter than atoms. It's quite easy to move bits around. And we have a machine that works great and can be programmed just like Gilbreth proposed, just like Taylor wanted. Again from Taylor, in our scheme, we do not ask for the initiative of men. We do not want any initiative. All we want of them is to obey the orders we give them, do what we say, do it quick. On good days, this is a computer. So in our modern day, maybe in software development, you might argue, yes, there are simple things. Computers do that. We are left with the complicated and the complex. Which means that, like Jürgen Appel said during his keynote, everybody is a manager in software. Because the workers are machines. Doing the job is... Uh, you know the old... Uh, a few years ago, I still remember people coming up with this parallel. It's like building uh, a bridge. There is the architect, he sinks the bridge. Then there are the workers, they build the bridge. So they said, of course we need an architect, right? He's the smart guy. Then we can hire cheap workers from India to actually build the thing. That's also true in software. No. In software, the worker is a computer, and building the bridge is so instantaneous and cheap that you don't even notice it. Usually we call it compilation. <coughs> Everybody else is an architect or a manager, somebody dealing with complicated or complex things. So software development is a frog. Maybe it's a 747, but probably a frog. Scientific management here, software there. They don't overlap, that's it. I said software, but this is true for any modern knowledge work. Only most of the industry didn't notice it yet. Hmm. Let me come to my conclusion. Uh, I will recap the entire logical flow. Standard industrial practices, like best practices, defining procedures, enforcing procedures, and so on and so on, they all come from scientific management. Essentially, they are scientific management. We didn't evolve much. Scientific management is great. It works. It still works. Only it works for simple stuff. Pity that most of what we do today, in particular software, is not simple. It's either complex or complicated. That's why standard industrial practices do not deliver software. I mean, you can probably deliver software. You can probably deliver software by, I don't know, uh, isolating yourself in a cave and eating lizards but you deliver software in spite of that, not because of that. <coughs> Traditional companies can still deliver software in spite of their stupid procedures. This is why we do Agile. Uh, some people still say, oh, Agile is a reaction to waterfall. I don't know why we keep saying that. That's not true. As Agile is not a reaction to waterfall. Nothing is a reaction to waterfall because waterfall does not exist. It never did. Did you ever seriously see anybody applying waterfall by the book and coming up with software at the end? I didn't. I don't think it's even possible. Serious? You freeze the specs on Friday and then on Monday, you start working on implementation and you never touch the specs again, it's impossible. It never happened. It's a straw man, okay? We never said 
it sh or should say that Agile opposes to Waterfall because Waterfall is a strong man, it doesn't exist. Agile is the opposite of scientific management, which did exist. It worked quite well, but not anymore. That's why we do Agile. I'm Paolo Perotta. I talk about bicycles, 747 and frogs. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Jose Ramon from Aguilar. Uh, I, I like the way you have introduced this topic, we better reason it. Uh, and my question is, uh, do you think that software development is complex by default? Or maybe, because it's a new concept, maybe it's with the time and with the things we learn, can move into the com uh, complicated and then into the simple, someday? Uh. My, my guess is as good as yours, Honest, but what I do see is that the bar is moving. That is, what used to be complex 20 years ago is now just complicated, but we do more complex things. For example, now I'm not suffering to find a library that does, does pretty much what I want. I go to and I, and I find a lot of stuff but I'm assembling these pieces into something even more complex. Plus, there are some things that are always going to be complex. Understanding what the customer wants. <laughs> Until we come up with artificial intelligence, yeah, somebody has to understand this person. I grew up in a world where uh, so many, we, we used to say, oh, the customer doesn't know what he wants. And we, we kept complaining about that for a very long time. And at some point, somebody came up and said, OK, do you want to do something about that? Or are you going to complain for the rest of your life? And that was essentially the idea of Agile. The only way to deal with something complex, like understanding what the customer wants, is to do it in small iterations. Show something to the customer, get feedback. Uh, hi, Paolo. It's nice to see you. Hey. Great presentation. Thanks. My question is uh, how to deal in the real world when, for example, my boss comes to me and says, uh, we need to uh, finish that in three days because of business. Uh, I don't care. It's too complex. I pay for you for do that. Thank you. Uh, I, I wouldn't be here speaking, I would be on a beach sipping mango juice if I had a, an answer to these kind of questions. So I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm giving you the stock agile answer. Why is your boss asking for that? Well, there is probably a system where nobody trusts anybody else and uh, people just push each other over the brink. The customer is probably harassing your boss, and your boss is harassing you, and so on and so on. So, uh, if you do small iterations, one of the advantages of that is that you show that you can manage this complexity, and hopefully create a system where people ease up. But the, uh, your question is essentially, how can I solve this complex problem? And I don't know, it's a complex problem, it depends. You're welcome. Uh, by the way, answering your question as well, if you actually learn to say no, and if we all say no a lot of times, that sort of situation will, will stop for sure. And that's probably the harder thing, it's actually to say no, it's not possible, that's it. <laughs> so, yeah, I've been it, sometimes that. that's very much worth trying. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, so, um, one of the terms that we used a lot in the past, and thank God that kind of stopped, was 
telling that the, soft, the, the software industry or the, the majority of the software houses were actually a software factory. So it was a kind of a factory of, of doing software. Do you think that this term that nowadays kind of faded away, but it was quite used in the past, helped a lot on applying this Taylorism to, to what we do right now and that, that we are trying to get rid of? Um, what do you think about that? You can probably guess what I think. Software factories were to be, uh, well, I don't want to be overly critical, but it's a huge load of dingo shit. It's uh, the biggest load of bullshit ever. And the only reason why they existed is that they resonated with market back then. So I remember there was actually a site sponsored by Microsoft about software factories that went exactly by that line of thinking. Hey, we could build the Ford Model T by having people around an assembly line. Why not software? And this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what software is about. But it did appeal to managers who were steeped into the early 20th century and nothing, nothing much uh, besides that. So it did catch up for a short while, but it flared away quickly because uh, it didn't work. Uh, that site, by the way, I went to the internet to check whether it's still there. No. <laughs> they removed it. Thank you for a great presentation, Paula. You You're welcome. <laughs> Um, I want to challenge you a bit on the, you, you, you base your presentation quite a lot on the Kinevin model as a sense-making model. Um, just a bit of, what would you say about software development and the chaotic side, which we didn't mention here, and about emergence of novel practices, rather than emerging novel practices there, and would it be smart to every now and then throw ourselves into that domain? Sorry for extending it a bit. But yeah, it's fine. It's, uh, indeed, I, I, I got inspired by the CANF model, but I didn't follow the model. In the model, there is a fourth state. It's chaotic. In chaos, you cannot see any relationship between cause and effect, even after the fact. The mnemonic for chaos is a bar new house. What do you do? Get the hell out of there. What can you learn from the experience? Not much. But the reason why I skipped this part of the model is I don't know what to do with that. I don't have any pragmatic advice. I mean, if your, your uh, current company is in a state of chaos, well, the model says, OK, this is where new practices emerge. Oh, I would still bug you off. I would still get the hell out of there, but I just don't know what to do with that piece of information. Uh, hello. Excuse my English. Uh, okay, if I understand Please. well. Excuse mine. <laughs> um, so, developing software, the, the level of complexity uh, may depend on what this software is for, the compass of the, of the goal of the deal. Yeah. Maybe it could be we can develop something easy, so it could be simple, maybe, because of the knowledge we have in, the, in that area. Yeah, up to a point. There is one thing with software that makes it very different than most things that we built in the past. It's, uh, you can duplicate it at zero cost. So to make a comparison, if I'm building this column, I see that it works and I say, hey, that was easy. Let's build another. And I still have to build it. If I do the same with software, I see, hey, this program is running. Let's build another and I start another process. The only case where I really need to go into the source code and write something new is that, no, it's not exactly this that I need. It's something different. Maybe slightly different, but it's something new. 
every software project is by definition new. Otherwise, you just use whatever is already there. This is a generalization. Of course, some projects are more new than others. Some projects, you look at them and you say, oh, come on, you are reinventing this wheel. You say, okay, this is really easy. But it's never, it never comes down to the point where you can say it's simple. Because simple means a machine could do it. If a machine could do it, then you don't need a programmer. Yeah, but when you produce software, and you try to make it simple, more simple, but because it's, it's going to be more effective or productive, so, so because you try to maybe uh, compare that situation with another one you know before, and try to, to apply that experience to, to that complexity and make it simple and predictable. The, um, uh, no, please, sir. And, and maybe you, this is a bad idea because maybe usually we are doing, every day we're doing different things, that's true because the client is different and, and everything is different. But as a professional, you try to, to put your experience and, and your knowledge and to take advantage of that. On that. Or you better think, no, no, we're doing a, a new thing. Sorry. You are right. You build new software and you try to make it simple. Now compare this to the guy loading iron and the guy with the clock. If you are building software, you are not the guy loading iron. You are the man with the clock, trying to make something else simple. And making something else simple is not simple. So, ultimately, the slave who's doing the simple thing is this machine. And it's true that you're trying to make this thing conceptually simple. But as most developers know, doing something simple is an extreme extremely complex activity. It requires a lot of brain power. The simpler, the more brain power. Thanks a lot.